right, folks, let's uh, get started with blazing into summer. I'm Ed Charbonneau. I'm here on the Code It Live channel, and I am hosting the Code or sorry, the uh, Blazing into Summer with Telerik event all week. Uh, we're going to have shows lined up all week long, um, including folks from uh, Microsoft. So you'll see uh, the program manager for Blazor, uh, Daniel Roth, joining us on Wednesday. And uh, we have some community members this week as well. So you'll see uh, Microsoft MVP, Chris Santi, Blazor expert, joining me on Thursday. Uh, and we have a special webinar that you can sign up for on Tuesday, tomorrow. So uh, hit that link that you can see on your screen there, uh, tinyurl.com, uh, blazing-summer, and you can sign up for all of the things that uh, we have to offer this week. Um, questions rolling in already. This is great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smoofy. Um, Will we be talking about what is Blazor and why would we want to use it over everything else available? We can get into that. And uh, we have a quick introduction of uh, kind of the architecture to start off with. We'll build some components and uh, we'll stick around for questions as long as you have them. So uh, just uh, stay around, ask what you'd like to learn, and I'll try my best to cover it. All right, so let's uh, kick things off with what is Blazor. So Blazor is a brand new uh, web framework from Microsoft. It uses C Sharp and HTML, and it runs all of that in the browser. Uh, this is originally where it gets its name from because we have the Razor View Engine running in the browser, and Browser plus Razor is Blazor. Uh, so let's talk about the facts of uh, Blazor, what it is, kind of what it isn't. Um, Blazor is it is a web standard technology based framework. So it is client side C sharp. We're not running um, our code in JavaScript. We're actually running C sharp on the client using web standard technologies um, such as WebAssembly, and it runs .NET standard DL. Okay, guys, I'm um, not sure what happened there. I think Twitch dropped our stream. So a quick reconnection seems to have done the trick, and we're back. Um, I'll start again from the top. So we're talking about um, uh, just the facts of Blazor, what it is, what it isn't. Uh, so Blazor is client-side C-sharp. Uh, running in the browser using web standard technology. So we're not using any plugins or anything uh, that may be familiar from the past, like Silverlight. Um, it's using WebAssembly to run those .NET standard assemblies, and we can use things that were written in .NET before uh, Blazor was even around. So we're actually running .NET libraries in the browser. It's pretty cool technology. We'll get a little more into um, how those bits work in just a minute. But first, let's talk about what's not there. It's not a plugin. Again, this isn't Silverlight all over again. Neither is it web forms. So web forms uh, is a great platform, but uh, this is not web forms. It's not based on web forms. There's no legacy code in here, no view state, anything like that. Um, it does have some similarities to web forms. Um, in my opinion, this is because it is based on .NET technologies. So uh, you'll see a lot of similar code patterns and things like that. But uh, this is more indicative to uh, C Sharp and in the way things are written in the language. Um, and there's no transpilation here, so we're not transpiling any C Sharp code into JavaScript or anything like that. There's no TypeScript involved, uh, nothing of those sorts. Some of the key differences for me, and this was one of the questions that, that we were asked at the top of the hour here, uh, what does Blazor offer over existing 
uh, JavaScript based frameworks. Um, for me, the key benefit here is that I can use .NET standard technologies. So I can use NuGet packages that I already know and love. Um, I can go out and grab things and use them cross-platform. Uh, these are uh, .NET libraries that work on uh, web, desktop, mobile, in the cloud, you name it, uh, because they're .NET standard libraries. I'm relying on my MS build system rather than something like Webpack or some of the JavaScript tooling that can be quite uh, cumbersome to configure. Uh, there's a lot less uh, configuration taking place in a Blazor app than you might find in a modern JavaScript application. And of course, there's C Sharp language. That's one of my favorite languages to write in. Um, even though I know TypeScript and JavaScript quite well, C Sharp has uh, the benefit of being a strongly typed compiled language. So you get really good IntelliSense and those type of things makes you uh, extremely productive um, when you're in your, your favorite um, editor environment. Uh, especially if you're a Visual Studio user like me, you'll find it um, quite familiar with all of the IntelliSense and whatnot that you get in the editor. Uh, as far as JavaScript goes, uh, we don't need to rely on NPM packages, although we can if we'd like. Uh, you're certainly not going to need Webpack. Again, you could use these technologies if you wanted them because Blazor is a web-based technology stack. Um, you can use these things. You can also use TypeScript and JavaScript, but again, it's not needed. You can write 99% uh, of your application code in C Sharp. Um, there's a few edge cases where you might need some JavaScript, but it's pretty easy to find some libraries um, currently to patch in uh, things that you need. So let's take a quick, um, quick discussion around WebAssembly and talk about what it is. So WebAssembly is a uh, web standard technology it's an assembly-like like format that uses uh, <clears throat> executable code in web pages. And this is what makes Blazor possible because we're actually running a special .NET runtime that was compiled to WebAssembly in the web client. And Blazor is running in that web client with all of the things that you would expect out of a modern uh, web application framework. We have dependency injection, a rich component model, debugging, and especially uh, close to my heart, component packages, because here at Progress, we specialize in those things. And we already have a robust component library with 40 plus components uh, for Blazor already here and ready to go. So let's talk a little bit about the stack for uh, a Blazor application. And on the client side, or sorry, there's two versions of Blazor. We need to get this out of the way really quick. Uh, so let me back up for a second. We'll talk about each stack individually uh, once we talk about the hosting modes here. There is client side Blazor, which we'll be talking about primarily today. Uh, this is what folks are interested in is running Blazor on the client. Um, we run uh, Blazor completely client side and Blazor interacts with the DOM and does all the work that we need. Um, like your typical spa application. And then there's server-side Blazor. So we can run all of our code on the server side with a thin client-like uh, technology over SignalR where the, there's a small library in the, uh, the client that keeps the application running on the server in sync with the browser. So again, we're gonna focus mainly on the client-side stuff today. Uh, so let's talk about how the client-side uh, technology works. In your typical application in the web browser, you write JavaScript and that JavaScript gets parsed in the browser. Then that JavaScript that's been parsed gets compiled and turned into bytecode. And that bytecode executes and runs against APIs in the browser and uh, makes our applications work. Now that we have the WebAssembly technology, we can actually write bytecode that runs directly in the browser without that JavaScript parse and compilation step. 
So what's nice about this is we can parse and compile our code outside of the browser, which means we can use other technologies like C++. And that's what the, the uh, .NET team has done, is they've taken the .NET runtime and used some special tooling to compile the .NET runtime to run, or to, to a WebAssembly bytecode so it can run natively in the browser. So this is the mono runtime for WebAssembly, and you'll see this sometimes referred to as mono.wasm. And that's uh, where Blazor sits. It runs on top of this mono runtime for WebAssembly, and it's running in WebAssembly in the browser. And that's how we're able to load our .NET libraries directly into the browser and run them client-side in our web application. Uh, some quick questions before we move along. Uh, Jade, Jade of Guru uh, asks, uh, will client side be able to access file system on the server uh, with uploads, downloads, etc.? cetera? Um, so Blazor is a typical web client, uh, not unlike JavaScript. So when we use Blazor just because it's .NET, um, we don't get anything that is um, special to uh, access things like client information, like their their um, Active Directory login. Uh, we can't um, access files um, on disk. Uh, anything that we can't normally do in a JavaScript application, uh, we can't do with Blazor either. They run in the same sandbox inside of the browser. So this is an ex excellent question. Um, so for things like file downloads and um, and uploads, we would actually rely on um, HTTP calls and sending files uh, to the server um, and accessing them through server-side code once we have the HTTP call established. Um, so uh, Jeremy St. Clair is in the chat room and he's answering this as well and says you can use HTTP client to make REST calls to the backend server and that is absolutely correct. Uh, let's talk briefly about how server-side Blazor works just because we need to acknowledge it's there. It's a, it's a great alternative. Um, if you would like to um, run your code on the on the server. We'll talk about the pros and cons of this in just a moment. Uh, but first, let's take a look at how the server side is set up. So we can run our entire Blazor application in, uh, in our server because the Blazor framework is written on .NET. All it needs is a .NET runtime to run. And the, uh, the rendering model has been abstracted away. Um, so there are other ways of hosting a Blazor application. So in a things like that to communicate um, with uh, server resources uh, like databases and things like that. It is offline and PWA compatible, so it's got extra portability and you can make uh, desktop-like applications. We'll talk more about this on Wednesday when Daniel Roth joins us here on the show. Same time, same place Wednesday, um, we'll be talking in depth about PWAs. Client side also has a larger payload size than the server side does. Um, it is a disconnected environment. Again, it's a RESTful application. Uh, so we are relying on the server for uh, data and things like that um, and making HTTP calls with uh, HTTP client. And uh, client-side WebAssembly is running um, in a special interpreted mode, so performance isn't as good as you'd see on the server side of Blazor hosting. Okay, so it looks like Twitch is having a little bit of an issue today. Um, not quite sure what the deal is, but uh, 
I've got folks trying to help me and let me know when the stream goes down. So it looks like we're reconnected. Uh, we're just going through the pros and cons of server and client side. Um, I don't know where the stream cut off, so I'll, I'll go over it very quickly again. Um, we've got a disconnected environment with client side Blazor. A um, little bit slower on performance, a uh, little bit larger on payload size. On the server side of things, uh, we have better performance, less abstraction, but we always need to be connected to the server for application to work. So we don't get that offline mode uh, type of capability with server side Blazor. And we're also responsible for all of the server resources that um, the application consumes when we're running server side Blazor. So uh, those are the major trade-offs that we see with the two Blazor hosting models. And we're gonna primarily focus on the uh, WebAssembly client side uh, during the week of blazing into summer. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is a book, a free ebook that I wrote. And you can get this at tellerc.com slash white papers. It's the first, um, the first item that you'll see there on the list when you go through the link. Uh, just sign up there and you'll get the ebook for absolutely free. Uh, in... Also in the ebook is a few chapters on how to create components, which uh, we're gonna be walking through uh, some of those examples here on the show in just a minute. So we'll see some demos here shortly. Uh, quick questions here. Uh, do you see client and server side being supported in the foreseeable future? or will uh, client side become the preferred? Okay, so the, the question is regarding um, how will Microsoft support uh, Blazor and will WebAssembly become the preferred mo mode of hosting Blazor? Um, I think in the short term, the um, server side will actually be preferred uh, because of uh, the performance increases that you'll see on the server side of things. Um, we'll have to see how this plays out with .NET 5. Um, when .NET 5 hits, um, that should level the playing field a little bit, and um, we'll see if Microsoft changes the recommendations at that point. Um, for now, I think they would, uh, they would err on the side of server side. Um, as far as their support goes, uh, they have support um, on both client and server side Blazor now. Um, that happened during the build time frame, and uh, I don't think we're going to see Blazor going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, there's lots of big plans in the works for uh, Blazor um, as a framework. Uh, we see the Blazor programming model um, entering the desktop space uh, with something called MAUI. Uh, so if you search, um, if you search for .NET in Maui, you'll see some very interesting stuff that's happening in .NET 5 for the uh, desktop. WebAssembly or server side slower, depending on. Um, so some comments around the speed. Uh, so WebAssembly versus server. Uh, Speed-wise, it does depend on how robust your connection is um, versus um, how how much code that you're running in the WebAssembly side. So there's some trade-offs between how fast Blazor can be, but generally speaking, the server side's running a lot faster and depends more on latency. Client side uh, runs slower, depends on um, how you're managing your resources there. Um, is Blazor server or WebAssembly ready for a large line of business applications? Uh, yes, I believe it is. Um, we can, I'll show some demos, um, at the very end here and throughout the week of a line of business type of application, um, where you could see all of the rich, like interactions you would expect from a spa application. Is there a guaranteed support lifetime? Um, I don't think 
Uh, Microsoft has released, has an LTS release yet on Blazor, but I believe it will be coming soon. Um, it is supported, but I don't think there's an LTS uh, model yet. Yet. It is coming. I just don't know when. Um, something we could ask uh, Daniel Roth on Wednesday, by the way. If you want to tune in Wednesday, ask that again. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer. Um, as far as Blazor gotchas with containers, I haven't tried hosting Blazor in a container myself yet, so I'm sorry I don't have any advice on containers at the moment. Um, I think it was Jeremy Lickness that was doing some um, some work on that. You might want to follow uh, his blog out there. So Jeremy Lickness is a good resource to follow on Twitter. Uh, do you think Blazor will be a replacement for web forms and MVC app development? I believe so. I believe web forms, the suggested migration path will be to take those um, technologies over to Blazor. Um, when running Blazor on a mobile device, can I get access to camera, GPS, etc.? Yes, anything that the browser can do. Um, you can do in Blazor. You may need to write a little bit of JavaScript or grab a third-party uh, package from NuGet to access those things. They are not natively supported by Blazor, but since the browser supports them, you can access them. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for sharing uh, Jeremy Lickness's uh, links in the chat room. Um, let's get into some demos. I see a lot of questions coming. I'll try to answer them as we go. Um, I don't want to get too far behind uh, that we don't actually get to see some code today. So keep the questions coming. They're amazing. Um, Will Blazor run similarly on different types of browsers? So Blazor will run on all of the modern um, uh, evergreen browsers. So that includes uh, Edge, uh, Chrome, and Firefox, and Safari. Uh, mileage may vary on mobile devices because they have um, extremely unique browsers on some devices. Those things... Uh, like the uh, Samsung browser and uh, the one that is on the um, Kindle Fire Silk browser. Um, you may find different experiences there. I haven't tried them all, uh, but the main four browsers um, are supported. IE11, I believe, is not supported. Um, Mo mainly your modern browsers are going to be where uh, this works well. Now, server-side Blazor is a different story uh, because it's not using WebAssembly. So uh, if you're using server-side Blazor, that's a completely different ballgame. Um, server-side Blazor should work pretty much anywhere because there's only a small JavaScript to payload there. So let's take a quick tour of the different types of Blazor projects that we can create. And then we'll dig into some code and, and create some component libraries. And again, keep me on uh, point with the uh, stream if it happens to go down again. Uh, hopefully it doesn't. Uh, not sure what's going on with uh, Twitch today, but looks like we've had a couple hitches uh, in uh, connection today. So uh, let's go to create a new project. Um, with the release of .NET 3.2, um, we should have Blazor templates uh, right out of the box if we have installed ASP.NET Core 3.2 on our machines. And I'm going to start with Blazor application. I'm going to click Next. And I'll just leave this Blazor app 9 because we're just going to take a look at the dialog for a moment and see what we have available. Um, we have a Blazor server app template. And we have a Blazor WebAssembly app template. So these are our two hosting models that I talked about. And with the two hosting models, there are some additional templates that we can add to either scenario. So you'll see in both tabs, we have the ability to change our authentication model. So we can have individual user authentication, etc. cetera, uh, for both Blazor WebAssembly and Blazor server. We also have on the WebAssembly side, 
the ability to host the WebAssembly application with ASP.NET Core. And this is going to give us some uh, really nice benefits because when we um, use Blazor WebAssembly, it can exist without a uh, .NET server. You can even run it in something like GitHub Pages. When you add the ASP.NET Core hosted model to it, you also get server-side hosting, pre-rendering, web API, and you can share logic between the server and client application. So there's a huge benefit of using .NET Core across both the front end and the back end, and you can get all of that just by clicking on the simple checkbox here. Um, but again, you can use WebAssembly completely independent of a .NET server if you'd like. You can even host it as a, st a static file type of an application. So uh, we also can enable a progressive web application on uh, Blazor WebAssembly. So if we just check this box, um, the template will scaffold out the resources that are needed to make our application a um, PWA or progressive web app uh, type of application. So let's go ahead and we'll check all of these boxes. Um, we'll also include authentication so we could see the um, complete uh, laser WebAssembly application template with everything enabled. So we'll go ahead and create this, and then we'll take a tour of the files that, um, that the template generates. Uh, cheers, Eva. Thanks for reminding me to take a break and take a drink. So this is the file new project um, with everything enabled. We have... Um, authentication enabled we have a blazer or sorry yeah a blazer webassembly client we have a .NET uh, server with a web API backing our our data source and if we collapse all of these uh, solutions in our project down and take a quick moment to zoom in uh, we can see these items and we have our blazer client side uh, solution, our uh, project in our solution. We have our server that has our web API endpoints and handles our um, user authentication and um, identity. And then we have a shared application or shared project. This has logic that we can use either on our client or our server. So this could be things like um, data models. Uh, we can use um, the validation scheme through uh, data annotations, and that will work on both server and client. So there's a lot of interesting things that we can do when we're creating a full stack C Sharp application with Blazor and running that in WebAssembly. Let's dig into the client for a minute. In the client side, we have a WW root folder, which has our static files. So these are things like our images, any JavaScript, CSS, uh, normal um, web standard technology uh, static assets that we would like to uh, share with our client. We have a pages folder. This is similar to the pages folder in a Razor Pages application. However, in a Razor Pages application, we uh, Routing is handled a bit differently than Blazor, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. In the shared folder, this is uh, components and code that we share throughout the client side of our application. And then finally, we have our, our bootstrapping uh, files here, our app.razor, our program.cs. Uh, these are similar to a uh, command line application where our program.cs boots up the application um, is our entry point uh, for our code and then app.razor is our root level component that gets bootstrapped out of that program.cs file let's take a look now at the server side and see what we get 
with uh, the template. Um, we have an areas folder. This is for our um, authentication. This is the um, the identity areas that you would see in an MVC or Razor Pages application. They are actually Razor Page um, Razor Pages um, files that are in this areas uh, folder that route us through our uh, identity and uh, registration, things like that for our website. Uh, we have a controllers folder. This is where we can create web API um, endpoints for our application and consume those on the client side with a REST API call. Uh, we have a data folder for things like um, DB context and data modeling and things like that. And then of course our DTO objects and things uh, fall under the models folder. And then we have a pages folder again on the server side. This can be used for pre-rendering and we can put things like razor pages in here. Uh, we'll dig into some of that as well and see how that works. And then again, it's a .NET application. So you'll see familiar things like a program and startup.cs. This is a typical uh, web API application here. In the shared folder, there's not a whole lot in here because this is where a lot of our custom code will end up. And we have a weather forecast in here. So this is a sample that comes with the application that shows how um, you can share a uh, DTO or a plain class object across the server and client side of the application. So let's give this a run. Let's see what we get with uh, the template. And again, this is um, everything. Uh, this is the kitchen sink. So this includes all of the checkboxes that were available in the template. Uh, so we also get the ability uh, to run this application as a progressive web app. And again, we'll talk more about this on Wednesday, but just to show you a quick um, look at what a progressive web app can do, um, you'll notice that I can install the application, if we look up in the right-hand corner here, there's a little plus button up here. If we click that, we can install the application and we'll drop our web frame from the app and we can run it full screen. Um, we can also see a icon on the taskbar and a preview window. There's many other things that you can do uh, with that progressive web app uh, behavior. Um, in the application, uh, we have our register and login. So this is the authentication portion. Uh, we're going to talk about authentication in detail on Thursday with Chris Santi. Uh, we also have a counter and a fetch data example. And notice when I clicked on fetch data, it's asking me to log in. So I'm going to hit back for a moment. Actually, I'm going to have to, let's see, I'm going to restart start the app because I want to back up for a minute and show something before I get into that uh, amount of detail. Um, if we click on the counter, uh, you may have seen this demo before if you watched any of the build sessions, but just for the folks that may not have seen Blazor before, um, I'm clicking on the counter and it's incrementing a count here in the browser. And it's doing all of this on the client side with only C Sharp code no JavaScript involved to make that count update. So let's take a quick look at the code for that. So it's going to be in our client project and we'll pull up our pages and in pages, you'll see counter.razor and in our counter.razor, we have our button that you see in the browser that says click me and the current count being displayed. This is all being, uh, done through a razor template and we have our paragraph with current count displayed uh, that corresponds to a backing field in the code block and then our button has an increment count event that's triggered when we click the button so when the on click event fires we're going to increment that count by one so again this is all c sharp code running right in our client uh, and updating the ui on that button 
So very cool stuff. Now we can uh, go into fetch data and it's gonna ask me to log in. And in order to log in, I need to register. So we can see authentication um, at play here. And I'm gonna enter an email. And I need to come up with a clever password. And let's try to register. Well, it looks like my password wasn't good enough. Let's try that again. And now you can see I've hit an error. And what this is, is on my server side application, I've enabled um, authentication, but I don't have a database to store those users yet. So the application has prompted me and it says, I don't have an application DB context to resolve this issue. I can apply a migration. And what this will do is it will actually create a database for me if I click this button. And when it's done, it will come up and just tell me to refresh my, my browser and reload the application. So it says try refreshing the page. Uh, so we can refresh. And my register, my um, application has registered my login. Now there's a little bit of a trick here. Um, it's going to tell me I have an invalid login attempt. Um, this is something that you wouldn't want to turn off in production, but if you're trying to test things or do a demo like I'm doing here, um, there is a system in place to confirm accounts. So you normally send an email to the user and have them confirm that they're a real person. Uh, that is enabled by default. So we're going to disable this just for our demo today. And let's go ahead and restart the application just to make sure that change uh, takes place. We'll try fetch data again. And now I'm logged into my application and I can see my weather forecast page. So let's dig into the weather forecast page and see how all of that works. So I'm gonna go into fetch data, that's my weather forecast page. And the first thing I'm gonna point out here is the authorize attribute that has been applied. That authorize attribute is what triggered this page to force me to log in. So that's the same authorize attribute you'd use on the server side as well. So you can use the same authentication attributes, server and client side. So that's, uh, again, a, a place where we're using the same C-sharp logic uh, across um, the client and server side of the application. And uh, let me just take a quick look at the chat room, make sure I'm not missing um, any questions here. I saw some bit of uh, back and forth between folks. Uh, so I was trying to make sure, um, yeah, so there's a question here, can Razor code be in a separate file? And yes, it can, and I will show how to do that in just a little bit if you stick around for a little while. Uh, we're gonna write some component code uh, after a quick tour here of the um, File New Project experience. Um, it's actually uh, very simple. And uh, let's see, as async coder. Um, there's actually a better way to do this now than inheriting from component base, and I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. Um, so we're able to authorize our page through the authorize attribute. Uh, we're using dependency injection here. So we're saying inject HTTP client, and we're gonna call that HTTP. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna tap into a lifecycle event on the component. We're going to ask the component when it loads to go fetch some data and put it in our forecast um, field. Uh, 
So we're going to use HTTP client, get from JSON async, and we're going to call um, we're going to call this web API endpoint and expect back an array of weather forecast. So we have a weather forecast endpoint here. That weather forecast endpoint actually comes from our server project. So if we look under controllers, you'll see a weather forecast controller here. This is where the API um, calls and gets the data as an HTTP method. Excuse me, I've got something trying to fly in my face. <laughs> It is summer after all. OK, so we're able to access the data from the Web API controller. Let's take a quick look at that. It's just this uh, random data generator on, on this end. But what it does is it uh, calls HTTP GET and returns an IEnumerable of weather forecast. So you can see we're using a .NET type on the server. And then we're also using a .NET type on the client. And there's a little bit of magic happening here with uh, the web API controller and the client logic. So when we call the API endpoint, we're casting it to an I enumerable of weather forecast. The framework automatically serializes the response into JSON, um, so a, a JavaScript object. And then on the client side, when we consume it, Blazor automatically um, deserializes that into a weather forecast array of objects. Uh, so we never actually see the JSON response, but there is a JSON response between both the client and server. And those things are serialized and de deserialized uh, without us having to um, write custom code in between. So pardon me for one second. OK. So this is how the weather forecast page gets its data. Let's see how it renders the data. Uh, the first thing it's going to do is going to check and make sure that uh, there's data there. When this component lifecycle runs, it's asynchronous. So when it starts, the page will not have data. And it's going to attempt to render um, this component, and forecasts will be null. So to make sure the component doesn't crash the page, we're going to do a check and see if that forecast is null, and then let the user know that some data may be loading. Once the data is loaded, this asynchronous call will complete, and the component will be, um, as part of its lifecycle, instructed to update one more time. Uh, when that second update happens, the forecast array will be um, filled. And now we'll display a table of data where we can run a for each loop over the forecasts that are in the array. And then we can just simply write out the row of uh, data there. Is there any, uh, let's see, uh, question in the chat room. Is there anything similar to MEF for Silverlight to dynamically load uh, client modules to minimize the initial hit on a client Blazor app? Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not a Silverlight expert by any means. I never got into Silverlight, so. I'm not too familiar with the architecture there. Um, anything that you can do on the web um, as far as caching and those type of things, uh, using CDNs uh, and that type of stuff you can do to minimize um, initial loads. Um, also, Blazor is using a um, something similar to tree shaking in JavaScript. Uh, and it will actually analyze your code and eject anything that it is not using uh, from the libraries that you have referenced um, and your own code. Um, and this will help reduce the file size and improve load times as well. And that is enabled by default.
Um, you can use observables. Uh, another question in the chat room. You can use observables. We'll get into observable collections tomorrow on the webinar. Um, so if you've signed up for the webinar, um, there are examples that I can show you tomorrow about observable collections. Does the re-render change any instance member of the class? It does not. So the, the component lifecycle does not completely refresh the page. Um, when Blazor is um, telling the DOM to update, um, it has an object graph that it uses, and this is called a render tree. So it keeps track of all the elements on the page inside of a .NET class. Um, it only updates the UI that it sees has changed, but it doesn't reinstantiate the entire page uh, like an MVC view would. Um, so you're not going to lose any of your uh, instances. Um, did IL trimming come out of beta? I believe so. Um, IL trimming is in uh, this release of Blazor, and it's the official um, art. Uh, RTM release or uh, production release. Uh, so I don't believe there's anything marked beta or preview anymore. Uh, another question, do you feel like Blazor is set to replace uh, things like Vue, Angular, and MVC? Um, Yes, it is, especially uh, for people that are interested in, in writing C-sharp applications um, that run client-side. So one of the big um, production values is going to be for folks that are um, not experts in JavaScript and they want to keep everything in the .NET language. Uh, so C-sharp, .NET libraries, um, the MS build pipeline, all of those things. If you are comfortable with JavaScript and JavaScript is working for you, then Blazor might not be the technology of choice. Um, but it's nice to know that we have options now. Um, so we've had uh, three or four options on the JavaScript side for the last few years. And now we finally have something that targets uh, .NET developers directly. Uh, and Marin, thank you for a answering those questions there in the chat room about uh, LTS support. Um, and then Marin is uh, answering questions in here as well in regards to web forms. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Um, so the question was regarding uh, migrating large web forms applications. Um, they can't coexist in the same uh, code base, uh, but you could subdomain those things and do some, some clever work there to try to migrate pages at a time. Um, you might have a little bit of difficulty sharing some data across the two applications. Um, it's definitely going to be tricky. All right. Uh, so we saw how a few basic pages work. Um, a little bit about uh, the rendering lifecycle of an application, um, how we get data through an HTTP endpoint, a uh, little bit of authentication on the surface. Uh, we've seen about an hour worth of material so far. Um, we have had a few hiccups and got a tiny bit of a late start. So let's break this application down and start a new one. Um, and we'll, we'll build a component and see how the component architecture works. And uh, there's a schedule that says that we're, um, we're going to stop at noon here, but I'm comfortable to keep going for a bit. Uh, so I've got a quick set of demos that I wanted to show that really identify the simplicity of how to build a component with Blazor. So this is a um, server-side Blazor app. You could build this in client-side as well. The logic's going to be uh, pretty much identical. And uh, we'll give it a quick run. It's the same template, just with a lot less 
code enabled. So we're, we're not using authentication here. We have our counter and fetch data components as well. Um, we're just going to build out some stuff to check out the component architecture. So on the home page here, I'm just going to go ahead and wipe this out. And you can find the same example in the book. Um, the uh, book that I, I referenced at the top of the show, you can find that at telerc.com slash white papers. It's a free ebook. And uh, <laughs> we, um, we have the same example in the book there. So we're going to start with this weather example. And I'm going to drop this code that I have pre-written um, on the page. And it's going to be a good starting point for a, um, a component for our application. So we're going to use a lot of assets that are already here in the file new project template. And we're going to use the open iconic uh, CSS framework and bootstrap to build a nice weather forecast display. Um, quick question here, how can I use Blazor server and client in parallel? Um, if a user has, oh, uh, so you want to switch dynamically depending on the user's uh, connection, whether they're on IE 11 or maybe they're on a, a slower mobile device, something like that. Um, I have seen community uh, frameworks and, and examples that leverage uh, both client and server in uh, Blazor. Um, there, there used to be a way to pass a query string parameter up to the server and toggle that um, Blazor server and Blazor client. Um, but it's uh, not something that I would say is supported behavior, but it is possible. Um, is it possible to import and export text in a Word format in Blazor in PDF? Yes, actually it is. Um, so I'll give you a quick link to that. Um, yeah, Blazor dual mode, thank you for the link there. That's uh, what I was talking about. Um, also, if you go for the other question, if you go to telerc.com slash Blazor UI, um, you can actually see a demo. Click demos here. Uh, under document processing, you can see that we can process uh, Word, uh, Word and uh, Excel spreadsheets and PDFs uh, with Blazor, both client and server side. Uh, so you can check those out. Um, Eva, thanks for the link to the ebook. And then there's the document. Oh, Marin, Marin almost beat me to it there. All right. So let's get back to the demo here, a little code demo. Uh, this is what we're building. So right now, this is static HTML that I'm showing here. So I'm using Open Iconic to show the um, the icon. We'll put these side by side real quick so I can identify the different pieces of uh, the HTML here. So I just kind of copied and pasted this a moment ago. And what we can see here, zoom back out, and we've got uh, a div that wraps this component here. Um, inside of the div, we have a span class that shows the icon. And then uh, we have an H tag displaying our uh, temperature. And then of course our message is just displayed here. So we're gonna take this HTML and turn that into a component. And uh, this is very straightforward. Um, and it's what I believe makes Blazor uh, very simple to work with. Um, let's get this back up to full screen and go back to our component uh, or what will be our component. Um, so the first thing that we need to do here is uh, we, we've got our basic idea of what our component will look like. And it's just HTML now. It just renders one single weather box. And what I want to do is I want to render five of these. So I want a whole week's worth of weather forecasts to display on the page. So I need a for each loop. And uh, I'm going to cheat here, and I'm going to copy paste this in 
from a, a fragment I wrote earlier. So you don't have to watch me type, but I'm gonna go over in detail what this is. So first thing I'm gonna put is a Dflex container. This is a bootstrap CSS class, nothing really special here. It's just kind of a column layout. And that's gonna let us render um, anything inside of this box is going to uh, stack um, horizontally. And uh, we're gonna render five weather items. So I'm creating a quick range here of one to five. So there's nothing uh, dynamic here. It's all gonna be statically uh, created. And I'm just gonna repeat the same HTML block five times. So now if I rerun my application, um, and again, this is all C-sharp code, so I'm using a numerable.range here, and you can see I've repeated that code block five times. Pretty cool. So the next thing I wanna do is make a component out of this. And what I'm gonna do is go to my Solution Explorer, and inside of my shared folder here, I'm gonna create a new component. I'm gonna say add razor component. I'm gonna choose the razor component template and I'm gonna call this weather day. So now I'm gonna transform this uh, static HTML into a razor component. So this will actually be a component in my uh, application that I can reuse now. And to do that, I'm gonna go over to index and I'm gonna copy or cut this piece of HTML out. And I'm gonna just paste this over in my weatherday.razor file. And now if I go back to my index, I can just type in weather day. And when I close that tag, notice it lights up here. Depending on your uh, editor preferences, um, that color may be different. Mine is uh, orange for components. And pardon me for a minute, I lost my chat window. Just wanna make sure I'm not missing any important questions. And uh, definitely appreciate the uh, progress Telerik folks, my teammates for answering questions here today, keeping up with all of you all. Um, so now that I have my component here, it's gonna repeat that component five times. So I'm gonna refresh my page and again, it's still static HTML, but it's repeated five times using um, an actual component. So now that we have a component, we can go in and make this a little more dynamic. So I'm gonna paste uh, a code snippet in again. And this code has parameters inside of a code block. Now parameters are, um, how we get uh, external functionality or um, we open up our component to inputs. So I can tell my component that I want to create a parameter and it's gonna be a C-sharp property and that's gonna be called summer. Um, I also have one called temperature Celsius or temperature C and day of the week. Notice day of week is actually an enumerator type. So it's an enum day of week. So uh, we have full support for C-sharp types here. To make these light up in my component or display these values, um, I'm gonna go in and do a quick replace of a few pieces of text here. So for summary, I'm gonna say at summary where it once said rainy weather expected. Uh, for day of week, I'm gonna say at day of week. Um, and then for the temperature where it says 17, I'm gonna replace that with temperature C. So now these fields are being represented in the markup here. And I may have lost a little syntax highlighting. Let me refresh this view here, there we go. And it looks like everything is working okay. Now I can go back to my index page and let's see here, yes. So I'm gonna replace my for loop here 
with another one that has some values for those um, properties. And actually, let me wipe out one of these really quick, just so I can show you that I have full IntelliSense for this. So I can see my property or my parameter of temperature in C here. And I can even set it to something like the item uh, here, which is gonna be uh, one through five when that renders. So we can hit uh, F5 and reload. And now notice it's uh, writing out the item um, number for each of those. So now it says cloudy weather expected on Friday. I also want to point out that day of week is an enum and it is, uh, it's writing out Friday here and it displayed Friday no problem inside of the, uh, the rendered UI. So one thing that's interesting about Razor, uh, whether you're using it in MVC uh, pages or components, um, if I have a value that I put in my Razor markup, if it doesn't, um, if it's not a string and I don't explicitly cast it to a string, the Razor uh, technology will automatically call to string on it. So for day of week, even though it's an enum, I don't have to call to string here and put that in my markup because it's implicitly called uh, when the component is rendered. So I can just put day of week and it will render Friday. So now we're rendering out five items. They're a little bit more dynamic now. So we're starting to extend this component and make it a little more reusable. Um, the next thing is we have a static uh, icon that's being displayed. Um, my forecast was cloudy, if we take a look here, but I've got a rainy icon. So cloudy, rainy icon, um, it's not quite complete here. So I'm gonna add a uh, read-only property here called icon class and what icon class is going to do is when the summary is cloudy it's going to return uh, the string cloud when it's rainy it's going to return the string rain and it's going to default to sun and these are the the cloud rain and sun correspond to icons that come with the um, open iconic library. So up here where I have my icon class, this span right here, you can see I have the word rain. I'm gonna put that read-only property of icon class and render that right in line there. And notice with Razor, this is one thing that I really like about Razor, is I don't need a set of special curly braces or anything like that to uh, to concatenate strings inside of a piece of markup, I can actually just write it in line like this. So I'm attaching to the io-css namespace the icon class, which corresponds to either rainy, cloudy, or sun. So let's go ahead and render that. And you can see now they're all clouds because it's still repeating those five uh, data points, which I can find here in my Razor index. They're all cloudy. So let's add some data uh, now to this uh, forecast display. So I need to open up a code block here And this is on the page that's consuming my weather forecast um, component or weather day component. And I'm gonna use a type of weather forecast, but it doesn't have a reference to that, that type yet. So we're using .NET, we can just say using, and we're gonna find that namespace under the data namespace in our application uh, right here. We can see it in the um, project tree on the right hand side. So our weather forecast um, data type is gonna come from here. 
and we'll do the same thing for the weather service. Uh, but we're going to inject with dependency injection the weather service. So I'm going to say inject weather forecast service as weather service. So now I'm getting a reference to the weather forecast service instance through dependency injection. So if I go into my startup.cs file, we can actually see where this dependency is registered. On line 31, I have a service, add singleton, of weather forecast service. On my component, I can just say inject weather forecast service as a weather service, and it will automatically uh, instantiate that um, instance of a weather forecast service. Uh, let's see, in this case, it's a singleton, so it'll grab um, the instance if it already exists and use the existing one as a singleton pattern. So dependency injection is completely supported out of the box with Blazor, and we can just grab our weather service that way. So that weather service is going to uh, call asynchronous, and it's going to say await weather forecast service, get forecast service async, and pass in the current date and time. If we jump into the weather forecast service code, we can see it's just that same logic that renders a random uh, weather forecast item. So this is going to get back an array of weather forecasts for me. And it's also generating five items. And it's going to resolve that to our weather forecast uh, field, which is an array of weather forecasts. And then I need to update my uh, code here. So I'm going to paste this in one more time. And we're wrapping this code in a null check just like we saw with our other example earlier. So now I have, if the weather forecasts are null, display that it has no data. Because while this is awaiting data, we don't want um, to try to iterate over something that is null. So we're, we don't want to throw a null reference exception here. When we do have data, we're going to uh, iterate over forecasts. And then for each forecast, we're going to render a weather day component so I can say temperature of C equals forecast uh, temperature in C. Um, the display is going to be forecast.summary. And then the day of the week is going to be forecast.date.day of the week. So we're, again, tying into uh, the, um, the type system of C Sharp here. Uh, so that, again, that shows that we, we're not using uh, JavaScript, but we're actually using .NET and leveraging the best part here, which is um, typing and also IntelliSense. Notice I get nice, rich IntelliSense here uh, when I um, pull that up. And also, we would actually get an error if we tried to cast something like a date uh, to the day of week value, because day of week is expecting a, an enum, and this is a date time. So we need to say dot day of week and actually get the day of week from there. And uh, Panzerboy007, thank you for spotting um, a little bug in my markup. I accidentally deleted my deflex container. So these items wouldn't have displayed in a nice layout. They would have stacked on top of each other. So we'll put that deflex container back. And now we should be able to re-render this, and this time it's going to go out to our weather forecast service, and it's going to pull in um, some randomized data here and display it for each item. We get the corresponding icon. So sunny gets the sun icon. Um, it's displaying the correct day of the week, and it's displaying a temperature uh, value from that data set. So that's nice and easy to do. And this is where Blazor really shines with functionality. Um, the learning curve, in my opinion, is very uh, low. And I can take basic HTML and mark it up and turn it into components very easily. 
and um, I can use the type system from .NET to make things uh, work the way I intend them to, and everything runs pretty smooth. Uh, I don't have to troubleshoot errors where things are undefined, or maybe there's a type mismatch, and I don't have a type system um, to take care of uh, those things ahead of time. So what about customization? Uh, we saw where we can use some basic parameters to uh, display values, but what if we wanted to enter some custom markup in here? What if we wanted to display some HTML inside of one of these um, weather forecast boxes? So you notice we have here an HTML element, or a, sorry, a component, that looks a lot like an HTML element. And one thing that we like to do in HTML is put things inside. So we can open up an element and maybe put a uh, paragraph here and give it a class of uh, alert. Um, and we say maybe alert dot da or dash danger and have some custom message in here. Now this, is going to fail because I have not defined any template region for this component. We'll try to give this a build. Um, it did run uh, a successful build, but you'll notice if we try to, to render this, it'll say object of type weather day does not have a property matching child content. So the compiler is trying to hint to us that we're using child content and we haven't defined um, any child content region for this component. So if you've ever done um, custom HTML helpers or tag helpers, this type of thing actually can be fairly um, complicated. But with Blazor, this is actually pretty easy. So I'm gonna go back to my weather day example and I'm going to find a location here where I'd like to put some custom content. And let's say between the temperature and the body text, I would like to render a custom message. So let's add a template for a custom message here. So to do that, we actually use the same parameter um, system that we have for uh, values and we can say parameter and this is going to be a special type called render fragment. A render fragment is basically a template and it's going to render a fragment of HTML or razor in, in the place that uh, we define the field uh, for this item. And I need to go back here and make sure it is also public because parameters should always be public in Blazor. And I'm going to call this um, child content. And I'm going to give it a getter and setter. And now I can come up to my markup and I can say child content. Because remember that error said. Uh, let's see, I think I may have closed it already, but the error said it didn't have any child content defined and it couldn't render this paragraph tag. Now I can rerun this. And if I pull it back up, you can see every component has some custom message in it uh, because it's rendering that child content that it's finding here. Now, if you're interested in adding multiple template regions to a component, you may run into a little problem where uh, child content is actually um, impl an implied behavior. So you can only have one child content uh, per component. So what's nice is if it's not called child content, I can actually name the templated region. So I could call this custom content like this and then I need to change my reference up here to match and I could have multiple content uh, template regions with different names now so I could have a header 
uh, content or header template, footer template, and uh, body template, things like that. It had multiple render fragments that allow the user to customize certain regions of a component. And we can name them. So now if I go back to my component, we'll see that template region light up here. And now I get a tag for it called custom content and I put my custom HTML or component logic in here. So this actually can contain anything inside of custom content. Um, you could actually put uh, C-sharp code, you could put components, HTML, all of those type of things. We'll go back and re-render this again. You can see nothing's changed. Um, I just specified how I wanted that child content to be named. So let's do something a little more interesting here. Let's show how uh, Blazor can leverage some razor markup inside of that code block or inside of the content block here. So I'm going to replace this boring paragraph tag with a little bit of code. And we'll say that um, if the forecast calls for rain, we'll display a tornado warning for those items. So inside of custom content, now I have an if statement. And it says, if the forecast is rainy, then display an alert div with a tornado warning text. So now we can rerun this. And when the application loads, you can see that only the rainy days have a tornado warning. So now we have the ability to not only render some custom HTML, but these can actually be components. Um, they can be logic and a mixture of both. So that's pretty powerful stuff that gives us a lot of extensibility. Um, so question on performance, how performant is it? So <laughs> that's a very open-ended it uh, with Blazor. So with Blazor server-side, uh, CRUD is very performant. Um, very easy to write uh, Blazor server-side logic as well. Uh, you'll find the stack is going to be a little bit shorter than if you're writing a RESTful application. Um, with WebAssembly, performance uh, isn't so much related to CRUD operations, but overall page complexity. So if you have a lot, and I mean a lot of components on your page, um, you can notice some slowdown in your application. Is there a list of what instructions are allowed with the at symbol in the markup? Um, actually, yes, there is. And I'm going to try to remember where I've seen this before. I think it's at, uh, let's see, Razor documentation. Um, so if we look at the Razor syntax, almost all of this is applicable to .NET. So here's the link for you. Oops, Mark Marin already got it there. Thank you, Marin. Um, so almost all of the control structures, if statements, cases, switches, um, the only thing that's not really supported is something like a link query that, um, so in, um, in a um, React template, for example, you can say something like this, where you have forecast dot um, select, and then you kind of render your component out this way. Um, you cannot do that, but that's about the only limitation I've seen. Um, any of your other normal con control structures work. Um, switch statements, even with the brand new um, pattern matching uh, syntax works in Blazor. Um, Todd K, yes, uh, Blazor is a SPA application framework. So uh, let's see, where can we take this example next? 
Um, we've added a custom template region. Let's give our component the ability to be selected. So this is something that I get a question on a lot, um, is how do I go into my, my uh, component here? Let's render it uh, one more time. And let's say, for example, I want to click on these items and select one of them. So to do that, we need to manipulate our view model just a little bit and allow the forecast item to be selected. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my weather forecast and I'm going to add a field here. And I'm going to set a Boolean value of selected uh, on my component. Now that by default in C sharp, uh, Booleans are false. So this will um, initialize as a false. Uh, so no items will be selected. So our weather forecast item now can hold a value of whether it is selected or not. The next thing I need to do is go to my component itself, the weather day component here, and I need to add a corresponding parameter that um, says that the item is selected. So I'm going to add a parameter. I'm going to make it a Boolean also, and we're going to say that it is selected. And we'll add a getter and setter for it. Uh, we need to make sure that this is public. And we have a public selected property here. Um, this so far only allows uh, some data to show that it is selected. So the next thing we need to do is we need to give our component the ability to raise an event and let um, the system know that an item has been selected. So to do that, we'll use another special parameter for uh, a razor component. And we'll come down beneath our select here. We'll create a new parameter. And this is going to be a, a parameter of event callback. And it is going to return a day of week. Because in our example, uh, we are rendering a single week of items. Um, you could also make this a generic just object and return the entire object that was bound to the collection. Um, there's a lot of other things you could do here. You could return an ID number um, as an integer, all sorts of things. That, that's completely up to you on how you would like to handle uh, your select method and how it works. For this example, we know we're going to have five uh, days and they're all unique days. So my unique identifier in this scenario is my day of the week. So I'm going to go ahead and return that in my event callback as an argument that identifies which box was selected. Um, now I need to raise that event somehow. Right now, there's nothing that tells the UI that when I click to raise that event callback event. So I need to come up into my div, and I want this to be selectable. So I'm going to create an event handler here. I'm going to say on click. I'm going to tie an event handler. And when I click on my outer div, I want it to raise the unselected event callback. So I need a method here. It's going to be void handle on select or on selected. And when I raise the on selected event or I handle this click event, what I want to do is say on selected, which is my event callback. We'll go ahead and invoke it invoke that callback and we will return this day of week. So we're going to return the value of this component's day of week property. So that's going to raise our event callback and we just need to bind now the event uh, handler. So we'll say handle 
on selected. That ties everything together now. So when I click on this outer div, handle on selected gets called. It raises or invokes the on selected event callback and gives it an argument that corresponds to the current day of the week held by this instance of the weather day component. And finally, the last thing I need to do is give it a different look than the other rendered components. Because now it's selected, I need to toggle some sort of CSS value. So up here, I'm going to go ahead and just put a, um, a new string called selected CSS. And if my selected flag is true, then I'm going to render the background primary color from Bootstrap. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep this as a light background, uh, which it defaults to automatically. So now where it says um, background light, I'm going to replace this with the selected CSS value. So now I've tied together my event click, um, and when that flag gets toggled, it will light up the value. And finally, I need to go back to my weather forecast um, index page. And I need to actually do something with that event handler. So I can raise the event out of my component, but the calling uh, page needs to be able to do something with that to uh, not only identify which one, it, uh, which component it was, but set the uh, value on it um, and light up that component. So in here, I need to say on selected. Remember, this is the event callback we just created. Let's show these side by side. That might help get a little better visual here. So I'll use my, um, let me get the IntelliSense off the screen. I'll use my little zoom feature here and say on selected is actually picking up um, a delegate for this event callback that's defined in my component. So when this event gets raised, it's going to pass me a day of the week that was selected. Now it's my responsibility on the calling page to do something with it. So this is a nice pattern because it leaves me open-ended uh, to decide how that select event gets handled. I may want to run some custom logic before the um, the selected item actually gets lit up in the value changes. Uh, for example, I might want to do validation before I let the, um, the rest of the event get handled. So there's a lot of things that I can do uh, by um, letting the responsibility of what happens when this is selected uh, get put off to the caller. So I need to create an unselected event. Um, I'm going to copy a little bit of code and explain what it does with the select event. So I'm going to call handle item selected. It's going to accept that day of the week parameter. And then I'm going to go through the items. And I am going to select uh, the item that was clicked on. And then I'm also missing a little bit of code here. It got stuck in a comment. I'm also going to loop over all of the items. And I'm going to unselect everything. So I want to make sure the selections are all cleared. And then once they're cleared, I'll select the item with the corresponding day of the week and set its selected value to true. Now I can come back to handle item selected. Come back to unselected and uh, assign the event handler here. Now I've tied everything together from the page. So when I click on selected, it will clear any selections, select the first item that matches the day of week value, and then the, um, the, the individual item is handling the event callback and raising up the event that gets called here 
and so on. So we'll go ahead and render this and we can see this go uh, full circle. And when I click, let's see, let's see if I missed something real fast. Let's try one more reload, make sure I've got the latest. And I may have a small coding error. Let's inspect this. I'm not seeing. Let's make sure there's not a CSS uh, problem here. I'm not seeing my on click event raise for some reason. Let me just troubleshoot this really quick. I've got my on click event. Let's do a quick build. Make sure that we've got yep, current build. Um, we're handling on selected. We have our selected event callback. And for some reason, it doesn't look like we're hitting this. Let's, uh, so this is a nice um, learning moment here. We can actually set a breakpoint and we can see if our code actually steps into uh, this logic here. So we'll run this with debugging enabled. And we click and we can see that um, we have actually hit the breakpoint. Um, we can make sure that, uh, see, so Tuesday was selected. So we should be selecting the first forecast item and setting its selected value to true. And let's see here. We'll continue. So our um, our method seems to be hitting right. We're just not possibly highlighting um, uh, the yeah yeah. That's uh, we're not setting the value here. So thanks. Uh, I think Marin may have tipped me off to this here. So we forgot to set the selected value here. So, um, so the selected value here uh, needs to actually be uh, forecast. Because again, we updated the view model for this. Uh, when we added a um, selected property to the forecast item, uh, the weather forecast, we need to actually set that selected value to reflect that um, in the individual component. So it's missing a property here. So now we should be able to come back and click, and there we go, it's lighting up. And we can select the individual components now, and we can run custom logic inside of uh, this area here to do whatever we'd like. Again, maybe this is doing some sort of validation. So we wanna validate um, before Okay, I think I'm back. Uh, Twitch is misbehaving today. So um, I could see the stream go offline. Um, yeah, so I, I think Twitch may be having issues today, or maybe there's some uh, general internet outages somewhere, because um, I've seen other services be uh, pretty intermittent today. Um, so the long story short, there is a music service I use for the opening of the show, and that actually was very intermittent this morning. So it seems like there's something going on with the uh, networks today. Um, not sure what it is. Maybe it's those solar flares everybody's talking about in the news. Who knows? 2020 has been full of surprises. Uh, so if you missed, I, I don't know what actually went out over the air and what didn't. Um, I had forgotten to, to bind my forecast selected value. Um, so we were setting forecasts first selected as true, um, but I never sent that information to the component. So now when I render the component, I can come back and click on each individual component and they light up with the proper CSS value. 
so we can run custom code here. Um, we're, we're giving the, the consumer some important value. Uh, for this, it's the day of the week. Again, that can be a unique identifier, whether it's a GUID, an integer. Maybe I give back the entire object. Um, this is pretty common with the Telerik UI components as we give you the object and uh, any other event information that was raised along with it um, because you may want to do something like this and say, um, you may want to say if uh, selected value is equal to um, day of week, let's say Wednesday, maybe I don't want you to select Wednesday for some reason. Again, this could be a validation scenario. Maybe there's a disabled item, something like that. Point is I can run custom code in there. And there we go. Oh, sorry, I made that so I can only select Wednesday. <laughs> is not equal to Wednesday. So now I can select everything but Wednesday. It just shows you we could, we could run custom validation code or something in that spot. So this is how you can make your components a little more extensible. There's um, the event callback and raise or invoke methods that you can use. Wednesdays are canceled, exactly. Um, actually, don't want to cancel this Wednesday because uh, we're going to start closing out the show here. So let's wrap up. We saw a good tour, I think, of the Telerik, or sorry, the uh, Blazor uh, framework. Um, you can get more information from the ebook at uh, telerik.com slash white papers. You can click on the beginner's guide. You can find that demo that I just gave. Um, I actually have another link here as well. Uh, let's see if I can find the right one here. So there is another link to the source code. There it is. Blazor book examples. We'll put this in chat. This also has a link to the book itself. Um, so you can find the book examples here and a, a link to the book. Uh, and if you click on this repo, you'll actually get the examples that I just showed. Um, the weather example and anything else that is covered in the ebook you can find at that GitHub repository. Uh, so that is a handy link there. And then we have tiny URL, blazing summer. So tiny URL, URL blazing summer will get you to uh, the landing page for all the stuff that is happening this week. Uh, this is the long link version here. Uh, that is the week of uh, events that we have. Um, today, you've, you've already seen the tour. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll look at a full stack C Sharp application and see how to integrate with Entity Framework. Uh, we're going to see a lot more um, robust scenarios. Let's take a quick preview at what we'll see um, in that demonstration. So I'll pull up the completed project from tomorrow and give you a quick tour of what's to come. Uh, let's see here. I got the wrong, wrong one. Let's see if I can find the completed version of it. I think this is the completed one. Yeah, this should be the completed one. We'll take a look here in just a moment. Yeah, just want to make sure I have the right application. So this is a WebAssembly full stack uh, .NET application. This is what we're going to look at tomorrow. I don't want to give away too many uh, things, but I wanted to show, because we had a question about uh, how do we or, or how robust is Blazor and can it handle line of business applications? Um, so this application um, is about as featureful as, as you can imagine. Uh, we have data grids, we have authentication. Go ahead and log in. 
We have authentication. We can look at charts and data. We can page through thousands of records using server-side paging, sorting, and filtering. Um, we can do date range selections and pick uh, different date ranges, and we can correspond to those in our reporting. Uh, we can do um, templated data grids with rating components and um, template pictures and all sorts of things. And we actually have full CRUD operations in here as well. So if we wanted to add a new product, we get a pop-up with a nice drop-down that uh, can categorize what type of product we're adding, set the cost, so on. We can use an observable collection to uh, see what type of um, uh, changes have been made and update those uh, data points in real time. We can also do file uploads and we can upload uh, documents to our server. And we can even convert those in real time into PDF files from doc files. So there's a whole lot of things that we can do with Blazor. Uh, this is just one example of building a full stack uh, line of business application. And we're going to review this uh, several times throughout the week, starting with tomorrow. Um, I believe there are some frameworks similar to MVVM Lite for Blazor. They're going to be com community projects that you find on NuGet. Um, I don't know of any specifically off the top of my head, but I believe there's some out there. Uh, we're going to do some um, highlighting of uh, community projects on Friday on Jeff Fritz's stream at C Sharp Fritz's channel. The grid UI is a component. Um, it is part of the Telerik UI for Blazor commercial component library. Um, as far as contact info for the book, uh, we use that to give you updates if there's any related articles, new pages that get added to the book and those sorts of things. So there is an upside to that as well. Um, so tomorrow, uh, full stack C Sharp, Telerik UI for Blazor and any framework, uh, you'll get to see the Blazing Coffee app that I just showed you here with all that good stuff. Uh, we'll talk about any framework and server, um, server paging and sorting. Uh, Pyro, Cat, yes, I do work for Telerik. Uh, we have some prizes to give away. Uh, so Sarah's getting ready to give away a prize. Um, so I think we have some Bose headphones. Um, and then I have a question about the videos on the ebook page. So if you scroll down, there are two videos. So the first video is the first half of the book. The second video is the second half of the book. So um, they are quite long. I think they're two and a half hours each. So there's about um, there's about five hours of video there. Um, Samu Mars, uh, thank you very much. So he says I purchased a license last week for Telerik because the Blazor UI controls are amazing and quote, he does not work for Telerik. Very much appreciated. Appreciate that. I'm glad you're enjoying them. Um, they are very nice. Uh, I had a really good time building this uh, line of business application for our demos this week. Um, it's a um, full stack PWA. It's got everything you could want from a line of business app and it. Um, uses a lot of the features from our, our Telerik UI for Blazor components and grid and document processing and all sorts of stuff. And I have to say, this is one of the uh, few times in my development career that I was able to um, build an application and how I thought things should work. It just worked the first time and I didn't have to go back and uh, do a bunch of, uh, uh, jump through a bunch of hoops to make some like JavaScript thing, for example, just work uh, because uh, there's you no know, two different worlds of thought going on in my application uh, is very straightforward and, and easy to use uh, for me as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, I missed a question earlier that I never got to circle back to. 
Uh, let me close this example real fast because um, I, I just thought of this and I hope the, the audience member that asked is still with us. Somebody was asking about how do you do um, how do you do code behind files? And I'll, I'll hit this question before we go. And it's, it's actually really simple and we can do this really fast. So let's take our um, weather, weather day component again. Let's circle back to our weather day component. I didn't mean to leave this question out. So I hope you stuck around. We're giving away some Bose headphones right now. And while we do that, uh, 1 to 64 for a prize. Am I supposed to guess the number, Eva? So we will <laughs> we'll go down the middle and say, uh, let's, let's do 41. I picked 41. All right, so let's look at a code behind while, while we announce the winner there. And uh, we have our weather data razor. So the old way to do this, I think some folks in the chat room pointed out that you can inherit from a certain class, component base, and all of that. Uh, we're going to do this a much easier way. So I'm going to pin my Solution Explorer up. And in my weather day, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in over here for a sec. I'm going to use this naming format here, weatherday.razor, and I'm going to add a new file. And instead of weatherday.razor, I'm going to say add class. It's going to be a CSS class, and it's going to be weatherday, weatherday.razor.cs. And you'll notice this has a public class of weather day and I immediately get red underscores. So in order for me to have a code behind, um, I need to resolve this conflict where weather day .razor and weather day the class don't occupy the same class namespace. So weather day .razor actually gets compiled into a C, a C sharp class file that has a class of weather day. So in order to have the code behind, I could say public partial class weather day. And now the, the compiled class that weather day creates, um, it also combines with the CSS or the CS class, the C sharp uh, file that I just created through the partial class. So these two get combined into one class file. So now that they're connected through a partial class, I can take all of my code, can move it to the razor file, and there's maybe a little bit of cleanup in here, uh, just around some names or uh, using statements because those do not get carried over to the partial, and we'll just. Uh, clean up our using statements here, and we'll, the Microsoft ASP.NET Core.Components namespace will light up all of our parameters. And then in our code, we can actually take away the code block completely. And notice all of our code is now out of that file and into this one. And we can rebuild the application, make sure we don't have any errors. One build succeeded, we can do a run and everything ran just perfectly fine. And we can still select items here. And uh, now we have our code behind. And it's much, much easier to do it that way. It's also covered in the book. So if you grab the book, it's free. Um, that is uh, That code is available in there as well. Um, yeah, that's a good tip, Marin. So Marin is giving a heads up on the namespaces. Um, so it's very important to watch for namespace conflicts in partial classes, not only at the class level, but um, you have to watch your, your folders as well. So if you had a folder named weather day and placed all of your components for the weather day in there and had one named weather day, you can run into some issues. 
Um, if you need to resolve any namespace issues, one thing that you can do is there's actually a namespace attribute that you can add to, um, to your component, and you can namespace that class as uh, foo.weatherday. And then you would also have to do the same for the namespace here. So you can try to resolve some of those namespace issues that way. Um, and then, of course, just naming things to where they don't conflict with uh, the names of the classes. Um, sometimes the folder names can, can cause some issues uh, with the name of the class as well. So it's a good tip there, Marin. All right, did we did we get the prize? Uh, Kvenda Kvenda is was the winner. Enjoy those Bose headphones. Very very nice. Thank you, folks. Uh, Sarah and and everybody from the team. So that I think uh, concludes our first day. Um, of Blazor. Tomorrow is going to be a much more streamlined webinar. Uh, we only have one hour, so we are going to power through the coffee, uh, Blazing Coffee app, which is the line of business app that um, I've been working on for the webinar. We're going to look specifically at um, CRUD operations and uh, server side paging, sorting, and filtering. And then on Wednesday, uh, Daniel Roth will take us through um, how to build a spa application. We saw a little bit of a highlight on spa applications today. Um, and you can see in the spa applications, uh, just give you a little preview of Wednesday, we can actually use this app here as a spa application uh, i'm missing my okay maybe not i thought i had a spa application on this one uh, but we can install these directly to our desktop and all sorts of stuff so wednesday uh, danny roth will be on to talk to us about that he said he has uh, so i'm um, just going to give you a little highlight daniel talked to me the other day and he said that build went by very quickly. They only had 30 minutes in a session on build. So he has content that did not make it to build. Uh, he expected an hour session. So he has an entire half an hour of information that did not get um, seen at build. It ended up on the cutting room floor. So you get to see the director's cut of whatever he has lined up. Um, it should have been build content, and he's bringing it on Wednesday for us. So that's going to be awesome. Then on Thursday, we have Chris Santi. We're going to talk a little bit more about authentication and some of the things that you can do with authentication and um, how to get tokens from your client and use those to access your endpoints on the server and all that type of stuff. And then Friday, we'll see you on the C-Sharp Fritz channel. We're going to look at NuGet packages and cool things that are out there uh, for NuGet packages. <laughs> I know I, I told him I could stay longer than an hour as well, but Daniel's got a busy schedule. I think we're only going to be in for an hour with Daniel on, on Wednesday. So we shall see. Um, but thank you, everybody. We should go raid someone. Is there an EPUB version of the, the book? Unfortunately, there's no EPUB version. Um, it was hard to get um, the formatting correct for uh, both the EPUB and a PDF version, but you should be able to load the PDF into a Kindle reader very easily and view it um, natively on your Kindle device. Uh, that's something I've been uh, able to do with PDFs pretty successfully. Yeah, multi-targeting um, ebook uh, platforms is hard. It's very hard. Oh, don't raid Sam's going live after. Oh.
my my mistake there, Eva. I didn't see he's coming up. So we've got Sam Basu next. So stick around for a moment. Sam should be up shortly. And uh, we'll go ahead and let Sam take over. Um, I'm going to go back to my startup screen so you can see the schedule. Thank you all for joining me on the kickoff to Blazing into Summer with Telerik. I'll see you the rest of the week. And I appreciate everybody that came out uh, to learn about Blazor today. Thanks, everybody.